In this video, we graph the inverse functions for sine, cosine, and tangent. We start with sine. As we've seen in the previous video, when we have a function that is not one-to-one, -one, a function that does not pass a horizontal line test, we have to restrict the domain to get a part of the function that is one-to-one -one so that we'll have an inverse that is a function. Now, there's a lot of different parts of the sine curve that we could select for this purpose. And there are some rules to help us decide which part to select. First, I'm going to look at three parts of the sine curve here in blue, green, and red that we might consider using as our restricted domain to get an inverse. And we look at the first rule. It says the restricted portion of the domain must give us a part of the function that is one-to-one. -one. The function on this domain must pass the horizontal line test. Now, the green and the blue are fine, but the red is not. We can draw a horizontal line across this red part, and it crosses more than once. So the red part does not follow the first rule. We can shorten it a little bit, and now all three parts follow the first rule. Then the second rule, we must have the same range as the original function. The original sine function has a range, or set of y values, from negative 1 to 1. Now the blue and the red do that. They go all the way between positive 1 and negative 1. But the green is too short. The green doesn't have all the y values. So we could extend it a little bit. And now the red and the green and the blue parts all follow rule number 2, and they still follow rule number 1. Then we look at the third rule, and it says we should keep the x values close to 0 when possible. Now, what you're able to do with that depends on your function. But in this case, we can keep x values fairly close to 0 if we use the blue section. That keeps x much closer to 0 than the red and the green section. And finally, the last rule says where you have a choice between positive and negative values of x, choose the positive. That would make the red here a better choice than the green, but the blue is the best because of staying close to zero, so we don't really have to choose between positive and negative. So this fourth rule doesn't apply in this particular situation. Following all four rules, we conclude that the restricted domain to use for the sine function runs from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. We use square brackets because we do want to include those endpoints where x is exactly negative pi over 2 and x is exactly positive pi over 2. If we didn't want to include those points, we'd use round parentheses instead. Now that we've found the correct restricted domain, we're going to sketch the inverse of the sine function. We notice the original sine function has a domain from negative infinity to positive infinity. I've only drawn a part of it here because my computer screen isn't infinitely long. But the sine wave is. The sine wave keeps going to the left and to the right. It has a range, as we noted earlier, of negative 1 to 1. Now, we've just seen that the appropriate restricted domain goes from an x of negative pi over 2 to an x of positive pi over 2. That gives us a section of the sine function that still has the same range, negative 1 to 1, as the entire sine wave. And it also makes our restricted section one-to-one. -one. Now, to sketch the inverse, we need to plot some points. The sine wave contains the point pi over 2, 1, and it contains the point negative pi over 2, negative 1. For each one of those, I reverse the x and y, and now I have points on the inverse. Also, I want to look at the y equals x line. Points on this line have the same x value as y value, so when you switch the order, the point doesn't move. This is a point where the curve and its inverse should cross. And we see that the y equals x line passes through 0, 0, which is a point on the sine wave. And then the y equals x line is tangent to the sine wave, so it comes pretty close to the sine wave. But the only one of these points that's actually on the line is 0, 0. Now that we have those lines, we can sketch an inverse. It should look like a reflection across the y equals x line of the sine curve, and it should pass through the points that we've plotted. And then we look at this inverse curve, and we see what x values it passes through. That gives us the domain. It goes from an x of negative 1 to an x of positive 1. And we look at what y values it passes through. That gives us the range. And the range is negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Now you notice this is the exact same domain and range as the restricted portion of the sine function 
except the roles are reversed. Our restricted domain for sine, negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, has become the range of the inverse. And the range of sine, negative 1 to 1, has become the domain of the inverse. Domain and range are about x and y. When you find an inverse, you switch the order of x and y, so that switches what's a domain and what's a range. This red curve could be called y equals sine inverse of x. The little negative one means inverse. Or it's sometimes called the arc sine of x. Those are two terms for the same thing. You can use them interchangeably. Next, we're going to find the restricted domain for cosine. This is very similar to what we did finding the restricted domain for sine. I'm going to look at a few sections of cosine that we might consider as our restricted domain, and then go through the rules one at a time to make sure that we have a section that follows them all. The first rule says that we need to restrict the domain so that the section of the cosine curve that we get is one-to-one. -one. That is, a horizontal line should cross it only once. Well, the blue one and the green one satisfy that rule, but the red one doesn't. We can draw a horizontal line that crosses the red one more than once. So the red one is not one-to-one. -one. We can make it one-to-one -one by shortening it a little bit so that we get a section of the cosine wave that each horizontal line crosses only one time. Then we look at the second rule, that we have to have the same range that the original cosine curve had. The range is the y value. The cosine curve goes down to a y of negative 1 and up to a y of positive 1. And so we need each of our restricted sections to do that. The blue one doesn't. It's a little too short. So we extend the blue curve so that now it does go all the way between a y of negative 1 and a y of positive 1. But we don't make it so long that it would stop being 1 to 1. The third rule says that we want a section of the cosine curve that is near x equals 0. Well, we have two of those, the green one and the blue one, and they're equally close to x equals 0. That brings us to the fourth rule, which says when you have a choice between positive and negative, you want to choose the positive side. So we will use the blue part for our restricted domain for cosine. So the restricted domain for cosine runs from x equals 0 to x equals pi. Now we're going to graph the inverse of the cosine function. We notice that the original cosine has a domain that goes all the way from negative infinity to infinity, and it has a range from negative 1 to 1. We restrict it, as just discussed, to a section that goes from x equals 0 to x equals pi. That section is 1 to 1, and it has a range from negative 1 to 1, the same range as the original cosine. Now we plot some points on the cosine function. Reversing the order of x and y will give us points on the inverse function. The cosine contains the point pi, negative 1, so the inverse must contain the point negative 1, pi. The cosine passes through pi over 2, 0, so the inverse passes through 0, pi over 2. And finally, the cosine contains the point 0, 1, so the inverse must contain the point 1, 0. We also look for the line, y equals x, that goes through all the points where the x and y coordinates are the same. Any point where the cosine curve crosses that line is a point where the inverse and the cosine share a point. And we find one point where that's true. Using those points, we can sketch in the inverse cosine function. Now we look at the inverse cosine function, and we can see its domain, the set of all x values that correspond to points on the function. That's from negative 1 to 1. And we can see the range, the set of all y values that correspond to points on the function. And that's from 0 to pi. And again, we see that the range and the domain for the inverse are the same as the domain and the range for the restricted portion of the original function. It's the exact same intervals, but they play opposite roles. What's the domain in one is the range in the other, because domain and range go with x and y, and we switch the order of x and y. So this red curve now is the inverse cosine curve. We can write it as y equals cosine inverse x. That little negative one means inverse. Or we can write it as y equals arc cosine x. Next, we find the restricted domain to use for the inverse tangent. The tangent curve is not continuous. It exists in several separate pieces called branches. To follow the first rule, so that the restricted portion is one to one, we use only one branch of the tangent function. The second rule says the range must be the same as in the original function. 
Well, the tangent curve goes all the way down to a y approaching negative infinity and all the way up to a y approaching positive infinity. We have to do the same thing with the branch of tangent that we select. It must go all the way up to positive infinity and all the way down to negative infinity. The third rule says keep the x values close to zero. There are a lot of branches of tangent, but we've selected the one that passes through zero. That's the best we can do on the third rule. And the fourth rule says if you have a choice between positive and negative values of x, choose positive. We don't really have a choice. If we're going to preserve the range going all the way up and all the way down, we need both the positive side and the negative side. Notice the tangent curve has vertical asymptotes. There are asymptotes here at x equals pi over 2 and at x equals negative pi over 2. The tangent curve approaches these lines but does not cross or touch them. This gives us a domain from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, which we write with round parentheses indicating that we don't actually get to those points. We do not use square brackets. A square bracket on either end would say that the tangent curve included a point where x had that value, where x was exactly equal to negative pi over 2 or to positive pi over 2. Because of the way the graph approaches the asymptotes, that does not happen in this graph. Now we want to draw the inverse tangent function. Think back to those asymptotes, vertical lines, where x had a constant value. Well, when we switch the order of x and y to get the inverse, those become horizontal lines where y has a constant value. So the inverse tangent function will have horizontal asymptotes in the same way that the original tangent function had vertical asymptotes. We can also look at the x equals y line. The x equals y line crosses the tangent curve in only one place, which is the origin, and that says that the inverse tangent also passes through the origin. We can get a couple more points here. The tangent function passes through a point where x is pi over 4 and y is 1. So the inverse tangent passes through a point where x is 1 and y is pi over 4. The tangent function contains the point where x is negative pi over 4 and y is negative 1. So the inverse must contain the point where x is negative 1 and y is negative pi over 4. If we use these three points and the asymptotes, and the idea that the inverse tangent function should look like the tangent function reflected across the x equals y line as a reflection in a mirror, we can draw a pretty good sketch of the inverse tangent function. This inverse tangent function has a domain of negative infinity to positive infinity, which matches the range of the original tangent. And it has a range of negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, which matches the domain of the original tangent function. This inverse can be written y equals tangent inverse x, a little negative 1 means inverse, or it can be written y equals arctangent x. Both of those are used. They have the same meaning. Now we have found inverses for the three main trig functions, sine, cosine, and tangent, that you see used the most often. In a future video, we will also find inverses for their reciprocals, cosecant, secant, and cotangent.